Hi, and welcome back to my channel. Thanks for stopping by. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a short story entitled The Filmmakers of Mars. And this is a short story by Jeff Ryman. The story is only 18 pages long, and it's a quick, dynamic read. It's very enjoyable. It's a, it's a cool take, cool spin on the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter, Warlord of Mars stories. And uh, it posits the question, what if that stuff was real? And again, I'd like to remind you that there will be spoilers. The main character in the story is not named, and he is involved in film restoration and film creation. Uh, there's talk throughout the story that he has written films. Uh, he's had maybe a modicum of success with that, but it hasn't gone anywhere for him yet. Uh, so, you know, he's struggling with that, but he's also considered an authority on film and film history. And so it is, it's mentioned that you know, of course, if you're going to have a film restoration gala like this, you're going to invite him. At, the, at this presentation, uh, one of the things that comes up, aside from some other old films, is these 40 reels of film from the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. And the representative from the Burroughs estate says that they had a safe on their property that only opened from the inside. And when the safe miraculously opens up, there are 40 reels of film in there. And the main character estimates that 40 reels of film equals about three hours of movie time. Now, uh, there's a, there are a few other things that go on. You know, the, the, the character has some definite opinions about these kind of things almost immediately because he's an expert in what he does. And they start to watch the film. And uh, you know, the, the character is immediately taken aback at the technical quality of the film. Uh, that starts on Earth, just like the John Carter stories do, and then the reel takes a jump. Um, it's not done very artfully, and they're on Mars. And on Mars, he's a prisoner. The, the main character's in chains. He's hopping around. He can't handle the gravity of Mars. You know, it's much like the John Carter stories, only it's in, in this film form. And the, the settings and the aliens and the, uh, you know, the ability to jump in the air in 1911 and to, to show this kind of like weightless, uh, you know, like... Uh, superhuman strength based on the gravity of Mars kind of thing and all that other stuff. It was just not possible in 1911. So the main character is immediately convinced that what he's dealing with here is a hoax. One of the reels that they watch, as I mentioned, is a uh, day in the life of Santa Claus. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a disturbing little anecdote in the story, uh, but it's also um, uh, compelling and interesting because it, it hints it, it just hints that Santa Claus is a real person. And back in 1911, somebody shot some film of Santa Claus uh, bronco busting on reindeer and um, kicking around the elves who are uh, like uh, these surly little bastards who need to be kept in line. And uh, it's kind of like a Wild West, like Santa Claus type thing. And it's actually very interesting. And it's one of those things that I think that great writers do in that, you know, you can put an aside like that in a story, and the aside is like a, it's a whole story of its own. If you wanted to go off in that direction, it's just a rabbit hole you could go down and write a whole other story. To me, that's a sign of great talent. The main character is told by Edgar Rice Burroughs, great, great nephew, that they had a safe on their property, you know, as I had mentioned, and that it only opened from the inside to reveal the uh, 40 reels of film. And uh, you know, so this immediately makes the main character dubious. The, uh, the hero of the story is a is a rational man. One of the first things that comes to mind for the hero of the story is that the reels were all shot in 1911 and uh, the character playing John Carter in the story or whoever is supposed to be the hero of the story, uh, Blix, the, the actor, uh, in 1911 he would have been 11 years old. So there's there's some discrepancy in the dates because later when he knows when this man makes the Tarzan film in 1927, he's 27. But when he looks at him in the film, uh, he looks very old. He looks weathered and old and beaten, and he looks like someone who would have been around much longer. So Edgar Rice Burroughs and, uh, you know, and uh, Blix himself are playing with time to kind of disguise identity and hide the things that really happened, probably because they, you know, if, in the world of the story, they knew back then nobody could really handle knowing that were people filming on Mars. In watching the first reel, when Blix uh, finally arrives on Mars 
as the character of John Carter, Warlord of Mars, or is he just Blix himself? None of this is ever detailed in the story to any, any great explanation, which just kind of keeps an amazing edge of mystery there about, you know, what's going on here? Is this a story or is this a reality? It's just fascinating. But uh, anyway, everybody's naked because when you're on Barsoom, which is Mars, everybody's naked. It's not clothing optional. It's no clothes. So everybody wears a harness to hold the, the various accoutrements they might need to carry, like a trusty sword and a pistol or something like that. But uh, yeah, make sure you're in good shape if you ever teleport to Mars because it's no clothes. One of the things, as I mentioned, that strikes the character immediately is that the special effects are impossible. They're, they're decades beyond their time, and yet they look exactly like their time. It's a real conundrum for the, for the, uh, for the hero. He's, he's wondering what's going on and how in the world could somebody make a, a, a fake like this? Having seen this initial clip, he feels like he's dealing with a hoax, and so he decides he's going to make it his mission to uh, uncover who are the people that participated in this hoax and why are they trying to foist this hoax on the film restoration community? The hero's insatiable desire to prove that this story is a hoax leads him uh, on a short adventure that I feel ends abruptly in the story, but it totally works in the story. It's an abrupt, exciting, and very satisfying ending. The story is only 3,752 words, so you can easily uh, read it in one sitting and uh, you'll probably read it more than once because it's just a really cool story that sets a just a, a really neat atmosphere. If you're a fan of the John Carter Warlord of Mars novels, uh, all of that great uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs kind of uh, sword and planet, I guess is what we'd call it. Uh, it's a subgenre of space opera. Uh, you're just going to love this story. It, it's it's a lot of fun. It, it's kind of interesting how the you know the story is. Uh, put into our modern age and put before us, you know, in such a way that we have a, every reasonable ability to just deny that it's real. It's all just fake. It's uh, special effects. But the interesting thing that kind of helps you get around and helps you suspend your disbelief is that the films were made in 1911. Everybody in the film already looks much older than they're supposed to be and then later in their lives, they look younger. It's a, it's a strange combination of things. When I was reading this story, uh, one of the things that I really loved about it was that this story immediately allowed me to suspend my disbelief. I feel like this is just an incredibly artful piece of writing. You know, it's not even 4,000 words, and yet it contains so much because it has a resonance with the uh, entirety of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom works. So, you know, if you've read any of those or even just watched the movie, you know, or looked at the comics, you, you, can, you can tie it all together in just these, this short pile of words that gets you thinking, you know, like, wow, you know, here's a way that this could be real. You know, it, it's, it's always an interesting thing to think about a legend that has its basis in reality, right? You know, we, we like to think that a lot of religions and legends and incredible events have their basis in things that really happened. And this, this story sets up, you know, a, a perfect framework for, you know, the, a mythological understanding of how the Barsoom stories could have been based on something that really happened. And I mean, how fucking cool is that? Please like and subscribe, and uh, I'll see you soon.